is so good to see you. Uh, today we are launching our Christmas series, and obviously we're talking about the birth of Jesus. If you're joining us online, we want to say Thank you for joining us. We are so glad that you are there. And we also want to welcome our Parker campus who is joining us today. So we are blown away and so excited about what God has been doing on our Parker campus. Uh, Pastor Ruben, you serve with so much joy. It overflows to your entire team. It is so amazing to see week after week, either people giving their lives to Jesus or, or just the number of people that are gathering at the Parker campus uh, to worship the Lord. So Parker, uh, so Ruben, thank you for the work that you're doing in Parker. If you have your Bible or your Bible app, you are invited to turn to Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 8. If you did not bring a Bible with you, have no fear. There is a Bible located underneath the seat in front of you. If you would grab that Bible and turn to page 1018, that's where you're going to find Luke chapter 2. And if you're at the Parker campus, we want to encourage you to jump up right there in Alumni Hall. Go grab a, a Bible that's sitting on a table in the middle of the room. And uh, we'll give you a few minutes to go and grab that. I'll just sit here and talk for a moment or two while you go grab your Bible. Uh, the reason why we encourage all of us to have a Bible, to use a Bible during the service or during the week is because we really believe if we read God's Word and apply His Word to our lives, he is going to change our lives. And I, there are very few people that I've met that are content with how their life is going. Uh, everybody seems to want some type of change, and I will guarantee you, if you begin to apply God's word to your life, God will transform and change your life. So as we start this Christmas series, Merry Christmas. I got to tell you, this is the first year in a long time that I've really felt that Christmas spirit. I feel like I'm becoming one of the annoying neighbors that I once had. Uh, this year, for the first time in 14 years, at least for the first time since we've had children, I hung Christmas lights on our house this past weekend. Bah humbug, said somebody. <laughs> also on Thanksgiving Day, not the day after Thanksgiving, not the day before, but on Thanksgiving Day, my family and I put up the Christmas tree. We decorated it, and almost every morning since then, we have been streaming the Burl Ives Christmas Holiday Station on Pandora. So we're like waking the girls up, jingle bells, dancing through this, you know, all kinds of way in a manger and silent night and Christmas songs over and over again. Every day, over and over and over again, we're singing Christmas songs. So out of curiosity, if you would help me out, Raise your hand if you love this time of year. You love Christmas music. All right. Raise your hand if you loathe Christmas music. Raise your hand if you are sometimes so irritated by Christmas music, you feel like you could raise, rise to the level of violence against your neighbor. <laughs> so as I was thinking about this message and talking about kind of Christmas music and looking at the, the angels and the birth of Jesus, I wondered out of curiosity what the top songs were that people listen to uh, during the Christmas season. And there, I'm just, I looked up the top 10, but the top five is what I want to share with you. Now, I want you to imagine the songs that you grew up listening to uh, during the Christmas season. Whatever those were, I'm going to tell you the top five streamed songs. The fifth streamed is Brenda Lee's Rockin' Around the the fourth most popular song during the Christmas season is Michael Bublé's It's Beginning to Look. Third, let's see if you can get this one. Ariana, Ariana Grande, Santa, no, Santa, tell me. 
as the name of the third most popular Christmas song in 2020. Second is Wham! Last Christmas. And the first one is Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas Is. Now, I was surprised as I looked at this top, even the top five, but I also looked at the top 10 list and I'm very grateful that none of the Chipmunk Christmas album <laughs> is included in the top five or top 10. There's something about that squeaky, high-pitched voice that drives people crazy. But those are the top songs, Christmas songs, that we listen to in America. And it's interesting to me that none of the top five, none of the top ten Christmas songs that are played in America mention the birth of Jesus or mention the name of Jesus. Not one. Not, now, we, we do have Justin Bieber in the top ten, and he's singing about love and singing about shoddies, but we don't have any mention of Jesus or the birth of Jesus in the top 10 Christmas songs. Now, before we go picking on Michael Buble and Mariah Carey and Wham!, it's our fault. They're writing songs that people want to listen to. They're writing songs that people want to stream. And so if we're going to blame anybody, we got to start pointing the finger at ourselves. And I have a question for you. If you were writing your own Christmas song, if you were in charge of the melody and you were in charge of the lyrics, what lyrics would your Christmas song include? What would your Christmas song include? What values would you transfer into songs that maybe other people would sing? Now, if I were writing a country music song, it would be very simple what I would write. I would write about dirt roads, I might include Bumpus Mills, Tennessee. I would include people cheating on their wives, drinking, cussing, fighting, and mama. That's what I would include if I were going to write a country song. But what would you write and what would we write if we were going to write a Christmas song? For some of us, it might be time with your family. Maybe that's what you truly value. Maybe that's one of the things that you love and you cherish the most about the Christmas season. Some of you might write about giving or receiving gifts. Others of you might write about chestnuts roasting on an open fire. I have no idea what that is, by the way. I know what chestnuts are, but roasting them by an open fire doesn't make any sense to me. Or maybe you really do treasure the eight pound, six ounce baby Jesus that was born, that we celebrate during Christmas season. And it's no wonder that the popular Christmas songs don't include the name of Jesus or the birth of Jesus. And I'm not saying this to complain or to hate. It's no wonder because the culture doesn't value Jesus the way that you and I as followers of Jesus do. If they don't value the birth of Jesus, then why on earth would they sing about him? And as followers of Jesus, do you and I truly treasure the birth of the God-man the way that we should? If we've been forgiven for our sins, if we've been changed by this guy named Jesus, by his life through his death, do we value his birth the way that you and I really and truly should. Does it really matter to you and me? So I want us to read the Christmas story found in Luke chapter 2. And as we read this, I want you to, to really hear this passage. Maybe, maybe try to listen to it as though it was the first time. Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 8 on 1018. And in the same region... There were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people." 
For unto you born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Now, I want us to zero in first off on the, what the angel said initially to the shepherds. The angel said to them, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people for unto you this day Christ the Lord is born now I'm not complaining I'm just stating an observation I'm not railing against the culture but it does seem that today's culture when it comes to Christmas wants to erase the birth of Jesus from history Uh, From Christmas shows to Hallmark movies, Christmas songs, Christmas cards, Christmas decorations, they often seem to leave out the true meaning of Christmas altogether. And, And yet the truth is, as we know, Christmas means great joy for all people. That's what, the sh- that's what the angel announced to the shepherds, that Christmas is great joy. The birth of Jesus means great joy for all people. Now help me out by answering out loud yes or no. You don't have to go into dialogue or explanation. Just shout yes or no. Did the angel say Jesus would bring joy to some people? No. Did he say just to churchy people? Did he say to religious people? Did he say poor people? No, the angel said that the birth of Jesus would bring great joy to all people. Now, some scholars are going to argue and they're going to say that this passage of Scripture, this word all means all types of people. But I disagree with that understanding. I believe that all people, even those who have rejected Jesus as Savior, I believe that all people have benefited greatly from this relationship with God that you and I call Christianity. I believe that the entire world, civilization, uh, all the civilizations that have gone before us have been blessed greatly by the birth of Jesus. Now, followers of Jesus have not always gotten it right. In fact, during the Crusades, we were pretty wrong during the Crusades to beheading people if they don't profess faith in Christ. Somewhere along the way, Christianity got off track. It got back on track that today we can boldly say that Christianity is about a relationship with Jesus. It's about heart change and heart transformation and how an individual can surrender their life to Jesus and be changed and transformed from the inside out. But I do believe that the birth of Jesus has brought great joy even to those who have rejected Christ. So let me explain what I mean by that. History tells us that until the rise of Christianity, the culture had certain, certainly different values than what our culture has today. The, the Roman people, what they did before the rise of Christianity, they abandoned 
unwanted babies out in the wilderness. It, it wasn't just once or twice, but they would literally abandon a newborn baby out in the wilderness and allow the wild animals to eat that child. Uh, the Roman government maimed, tortured, and slaughtered criminals and lowlifes just for the entertainment of the large crowds that would gather inside the Colosseums. In India, whenever a, a, whenever a married man died, his widow was burned alive with the corpse of her husband. Whenever a chief died in Africa, his wives and concubines were killed with him because women couldn't live without their man. In most cultures in Europe, women were not allowed to be educated. Women could not speak in public. They were considered property of their husbands. Speaking of that, my wife and I are celebrating our 22nd anniversary today. So, so, that was supposed to be a joke. Property of husband, we're celebrating an anniversary. Those two thoughts shouldn't be together, right? And as terrible as it sounds, in the culture back then, Romans normalized sex with children. This was the culture that was in existence before the rise of Christianity. And you're saying, I thought this was supposed to be a Christmas message, right? And as Christianity began to spread to those parts of the world, People began to live transformed lives. Their value system changed. Their thoughts changed. Their minds changed from patterns of darkness to, to patterns of light. They were born again. They were made new. And as they were made new and the relationship with God began to grow, and as more people began, became followers of Jesus, laws began to change. Christianity had a huge impact on the laws. The status of women changed. The value of family changed. The value of human life changed. Kindness, grace, compassion, tenderness, hope began to grow in the hearts and the minds and the culture of the families and people that lived then. Nations were changed as a result of Christianity. Followers of Jesus began to dream up how they could help the poor and help the needy and help widows. And hospitals were created and orphanages were designed and built. Homes for the elderly, care for the poor, care for the hungry, care for the homeless. In fact, even most schools and universities began because followers of Jesus said, we want people to be educated so we can point them to Jesus. And it's interesting and ironic that in today's culture, we say, hey, Christianity and science can't coexist. Yet in the 17th century, some of the greatest scientific minds were followers of Jesus who believed it was their responsibility to understand God's workmanship, to understand how God created and designed life. See, I believe that all people, all civilizations have benefited greatly from the birth of Jesus, from the life of Jesus. People have been impacted over and over again. That great joy began as the shepherds left that manger and they began to tell everybody else what they just witnessed. Man, we saw angels. They told us about this Messiah, this Savior of the world. We went and we saw it and it was amazing and it was awesome. And we saw Mary and Joseph. This is the Savior of the world. He's here. God loves us. God is saving us. God cares for us. And as the shepherds left and they carried that good news, people were overwhelmed. People were amazed. And if you have surrendered your life to Jesus, if you've experienced the good news of, of not 
religiousness, of not Southern Baptist, of not attending church, if you've experienced the good news of Jesus, if you now have a relationship with God because of what Jesus did, I think you will agree with me. You're not gonna disagree with this final point that Christmas is astonishing. Christmas is astonishing. The, the word translated marveled in our ESV and the New Living Translation, it says everybody was astonished at the message of the shepherds. All people were blown away. And think about it. It is astonishing that God, who created us, would become one of us. That God would take on this skin, this body, and be born a human being. It's astonishing that he allowed himself to be born and that Mary and Joseph raised him and they disciplined him. It's astonishing to me that Jesus lived his life here on this earth, that he wants you and I to have a relationship with God, that he suffered on the cross, that he paid the penalty for your sin and my sin. It's astonishing that I do not have to earn my way into heaven. It's astonishing that I have been given grace, that I don't have to, to be good to get into heaven. And you don't have to be good to get into heaven. That's astonishing. Because if it were up to me and I were God, I would want everyone to obey me, be obedient to me, and that's how they would earn their way into heaven, by being good. And yet God said in his love for us, knows that we could never live up to his perfection. So Jesus paid the price for my sin and he said the blood of Jesus would cleanse us from our sins. That his blood has made us right with God. His sacrifice has made you and I whole and complete. That's astonishing. The message of Christmas is astonishing. The birth of Jesus is astonishing. The life of Jesus is astonishing. And I want to ask you a question. And I know that here today, whether it's here in Parker or whether it's online or whether it's in the room right now, I know that probably many of you have a relationship with Jesus. Many of you and most of you have surrendered your life over to God. You've committed to being a follower of Jesus and you've received that free gift of eternal life. But I want to ask you a question. Have you experienced peace with God through Jesus? Or are you like the popular songs of, of 2020, the popular Christmas songs, there's no Jesus in your lyric? There, there's no Jesus in your life. There's no Jesus within you. You attend worship. You go to church. You read the Bible. Maybe you come to church with a spouse. Maybe a friend brought you. Maybe a mom. Maybe your dad. But you personally, are you missing Jesus from your life? Have you personally trusted Jesus as your Savior? Do you know for a fact your sins have been forgiven and you have been made new because you've received Jesus by surrendering your life to him? Almost 30 years ago, I did what the small little Southern Baptist Church called I asked Jesus in my heart. I, I surrendered my life to Jesus. The, the youth pastor sat down and he explained to me how I could be forgiven for my sins and have a relationship with God. That blew my mind. I'd, I'd grown up saying prayers. I'd grown up saying rosaries. I'd grown up attended, attending church. 
but I never knew that I could personally go to God and know him personally and talk to him personally. Not through my parents, not through my mom, not through a church leader, but just on my own. 30 years ago, Jesus changed me when I surrendered my life to him. He forgave me. And since then, Jesus continues to help me. You heard me share a few weeks ago about the, 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 the depression that I had been overwhelmed with and the feelings of hurt that I had. Yet Jesus has continued to carry me through that difficult season. He continues to help me. Jesus continues to bring great joy to me. And if Jesus is missing from your life, he does not have to be. You are able to commit your life to following Jesus today. You are able to surrender your life to Jesus today. You can make Jesus your Lord by accepting Christ as your Savior and surrendering your life to him today. And you will experience that great joy in your life as well. Not just a benefit from the birth of Jesus, but you will experience great joy within your heart after I gave my life to Jesus, I felt like I could stand up straight for the first time in my life. I felt like Neil Armstrong walking on the moon. I, I literally, every step I took, it felt like I was floating up and down uh, like that. And I'm not just going to talk about how you can know God and how you can have a relationship with God. I'm going to give you an opportunity right now to surrender your life to Jesus and receive forgiveness for your sins, to know that you will be in heaven when you die and to begin a relationship with God right now through the gift of Jesus. So if you would like to receive Jesus as your savior, if you've heard people talk about Jesus, if you've heard people talk about, I was changed, Jesus made me new, now is your chance to commit to following Jesus and surrender your life to him. So I want to invite every person in this room to bow your heads, to close your eyes just for a moment. And I want you to imagine it's just you and me standing in this room. There is nobody else around. Just you and me. If you recognize that today you do not have a relationship with God because you've never trusted in Christ, you've never put your faith in the work of Jesus, in making you right with God. If you recognize that that is you and you are missing Jesus and you're ready to invite him to be your savior, if you're ready in your heart, if you're convinced in your mind that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the savior of the world, then I want to help you become a follower of Jesus. And I'm going to help you find the words to say to God to give your life to him. If you're ready to surrender your life to God, simply say these words. You can say them out loud. You can mean them in your heart. However you want to communicate to God, he can hear your prayer. If you're ready to surrender, if you believe in your heart, Jesus did die on the cross, he rose from the dead, and that he loves you, then repeat these words in your own way back to God. Say something like this. Jesus, I believe that you paid the price for my sin. I believe you died. I believe you rose from the dead. 
And I, right now, surrender my life and receive you as my Savior. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for paying the price for my sin on the cross. Thank you for dying for me. I give my life to you. I surrender to you. I can't do it without you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can look up, you can look at me. Some of you were still doing that during that prayer. If you just surrendered your life to Jesus, I, I want to give you a couple of options because we want to help you uh, help follow up with you. We want to help you begin to grow in your relationship with Jesus. In front of you, there's a connect card. Grab one of those red connect cards, fill it out and tell us today I surrender. That's all you have to write. Today I surrender. Put your information on there. As you leave, drop it in the offering box. A second option is for you to come down and let our prayer team know at the end of the service that, hey, today you just gave your life to Jesus and you're ready. You're, you're ready for people to know and for people to begin to pray for you. And then another way that you can let the world know of this commitment that you've made is by being baptized on Christmas Eve. Uh, I can't think of a better time to be baptized than when you heard the message of the Christmas story, you gave your life to Jesus, and you declare on Christmas Eve that you're a follower of Christ. There are many ways that we can help you, but honestly, unless you communicate, we can't help. Unless you communicate, we can't celebrate. And can I tell you, contagious celebration is one of our core values and we want to celebrate with you because I believe that somebody gave their life to Jesus. This past week in chapel, we had over, over, this is chapel at Calvary Christian Academy, over 40 students indicate that they professed Jesus as their savior during chapel. And if, if one of those are your children or your grandchildren, we have a baptism service coming up on Christmas Eve. But that's what God does. He changes the young and he changes the old. He changes the rich and he changes the poor. The birth of Jesus is good news for all people. That's why it's astonishing. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you so much for sending Jesus to be born. Thank you that he wasn't rich. He wasn't wealthy. Thank you that he was just like us. That he was born as a baby and he grew up and he loved people unconditionally. That he worked miracle after miracle. Thank you for his life. And thank you that he rose from the dead and he defeated death after paying the price for our sin. Lord, I, I want to ask that you would bless those who became a follower of Jesus today. I pray that you would encourage them and I pray that you would strengthen them and I pray that you would increase their faith in you so that they're able to tell other people that they've surrendered their life to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.